This video serves as an introduction to the uh, chapter on thermodynamics of electrolyte solutions. All right, uh, so before in this semester we have looked at uh, the thermodynamics of non-electrolyte solutions, which were those formed by a solvent and a solute, and you didn't have ions around. Uh, in this case, we're going to close the semester with uh, a look at uh, the behavior of solutions uh, that contain ions in them. Uh, the most important difference between electrolyte and non-electrolyte solutions is that those that involve ions, the electrolyte solutions, uh, are going to uh, differ from ideality. They're, they're going to uh, rarely be ideal. And that's just not the case with non-electrolyte solutions, which for the, for, for the most time, we were assuming that they had uh, either ideal behavior or ideal dilute uh, behavior. Right, so uh, again, we will uh, see how some of the concepts that we saw for non-electrolyte solutions get modified uh, once you have deviation from ideality, which is what happens for ionic solutions. Right, the first uh, topic that we're going to be looking at is uh, uh, one in which we're going to uh, uh, take a closer look at uh, how a salt, uh, which is formed by ions, dissolves in a solvent. And of course, the archetypal example of this process would be sodium chloride table salt uh, dissolving into water. Right, so when you take a look at uh, uh, sodium chloride in the solid state, uh, you actually have that that structure is formed by sodium and then chloride ions, and they are arranged uh, in a cubic lattice, okay, uh, in which you have that each ion is uh, surrounded by six other uh, ions of negative charge. Right, So this would be just one of the planes, this, this, will, this will continue uh, in this dimension, this plane, but then you will also con uh, see that this continues in the other plane. And again, every single ion is surrounded by uh, six counter ions uh, of opposite charge. Now the question is, uh, how does this dissolve into water when you actually put it in, in aqueous solution? Right, so when you put it in aqueous solution, you actually see that you uh, destroy this crystalline structure, and then you'll have sodium ions Okay, separated from the chloride ions. Right, in order for this to happen, okay, when you put this in, uh, in water, uh, it should happen, uh, it, it should be the case that the interactions uh, that you get in the solution are actually more favorable, stronger, than the interactions you have in the crystal lattice. And that's a little bit hard to believe because, of course, uh, this seems to me uh, that it's very stable. Right, again, you have a negative ion surrounded by six positive, uh, positive ions. Uh, which are uh, in the vertices of an octahedron. Now, Kim, that seems, uh, it seems like uh, the, the electrostatic interactions that you have in that crystal lattice would be extremely strong. And the question is, well, how can you get something as strong in the solution when you have that the ions are going to be fairly separated from, uh, from each other if the concentration is not very high? Well, uh, uh, what here you have to think about is uh, the interactions of these ions with the solvent. What we know is that for water, uh, you actually have a polar solvent. Okay, when you draw uh, the water molecule, we know that there's a negative end uh, in this uh, molecule and a positive end in this molecule, okay, which is due to the difference in the electronegativity of the two ions. Right, so then what you can think of hap uh, what is this happening here is that when you have a sodium ion in solution, all right, uh, this has a positive charge. Uh, uh, if you have a water molecule surrounded, what will happen is that uh, the negative end of the water molecules will be oriented such that it uh, interacts favorably with that uh, positive ion that you have in solution, right? So you would expect to have uh, this, and then that perhaps, and then that perhaps, and so forth. Okay? Of course, this would be a three dimensional uh, uh, envelope of uh, water molecules uh, uh, in which, again, the negative ends of the molecules are oriented such that they interact directly with the positive ion, okay? And what we actually know is that for sodium, uh, this is something that we call the hydration sphere. It's again three-dimensional. Here we only draw it in a plane, but in reality it's three-dimensional. And you actually have about eight water molecules uh, surrounding each uh, sodium ion or so. Okay, so, so then what happens is that even though the interaction of this partial negative charge with the positive ion is not as strong as positive with negative. You have so many of them that uh, in the, indeed having a sodium ion uh, in a solution like this is much more favorable uh, than having the crystal structure without solution in, uh, in the solution. Okay? 
Uh, now, this happens for water because water is a polar molecule. But if you, you were to repeat this process with a different solvent, for example, benzene, okay, benzene, which is not polar, it turns out that uh, sodium chloride would actually not dissolve. Okay, again, sodium, uh, uh, sodium does not have, it's not as polar as, as uh, uh, water is actually an apolar solvent, so you can have this type of solvation. Uh, and then it turns out that the uh, uh, table salt actually does not dissolve. All right? uh, now, a, a way to actually understand a little, a little more about this hydration sphere is to actually take a look at the mobility of ions in solution. Okay, when we look at the alkali ions, okay, you go through the predict table and go through the series of alkali ions, okay, down the predict table, uh, we know that the size of the ions in the gas phase increases as you go uh, down in the periodic table, okay? Such that um, lithium is the smallest ion and then uh, cesium plus uh, would be uh, a much larger ion than, than these ones. Okay, but when we actually uh, look at this in solution, we can look at the mobility of the ions in solution. And what we actually find is that cesium okay, moves faster than lithium in uh, a water solution. Right, so the question is, well, how is this possible? Well, the idea is that uh, when you have ions in solution, you cannot consider them in isolation. Okay? Instead, you have to consider the ion surrounded by this uh, hydration shell of uh, solvent molecules. Right? So what it turns out is that the hydration shell for lithium is actually much greater than that for cesium, so that when you add the size of the ion and the hydration shell, okay, uh, those two contribu uh, uh, components will give an overall smaller size, and that means greater mobility, than for lithium, where you will have a small ion, but then a large hydration sphere. And lithium turns out to move uh, much more slowly. So those type of measurements of mobility in solution is what uh, uh, led us to think about this hydration uh, uh, shell of molecules. And again, that is a nice way to explain how ions dissolve, uh, uh, how salts dissolve in solution. Okay? Now, uh, this also uh, gives us uh, uh, some perspective into why uh, electrolyte solutions are going to deviate from ideality much more than on non-electrolyte solutions. Again, remember that for to have an, an, uh, an ideal solution, what should happen is that um, uh, the interactions of uh, this ion with uh, the solvent should be as strong as the interactions of the ion with the ion or the solvent with the solvent. And that's actually not the case uh, here. You have the, that these interactions are very, very strong. They are actually much stronger than, say, interaction of a water molecule with a water molecule. And that means that you won't have ideal behavior nearly as much as uh, when you have no electrolytes in which this, this type of interactions uh, do not take place. Okay? So again, this is kind of a summary of uh, the solution process and uh, the origin of deviation from ideality of uh, electrolyte solutions.